Good morning, everyone. Well, today we're, uh, we have the privilege of listening to Mike Collins. A lot of you know Mike already. He's a partner and managing director of Building Industry Advisors. He leads his firm's practice in, in building products, M&A, advisory and capital placement practice. His research includes conducting semi-annual webinars on the state of the window and door industry, tracking the level of foreign competition in a dozen different building product segments, and writing for numerous industry publications. He's uh, uh, one person here who I know is truly plugged into our industry, and his predictions of merger and acquisition activities and market trends are typically spot on. He lives in Chicago with his wife and their three children. Please welcome Mike Collins. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I had uh, quite a few of you have come up to me and told me that you were really looking forward to my presentation. And normally that would be a, a really heartwarming thing, but the more of you that said it, the more I realized it was said in the tone of voice as if I said, well, what I'm going to do is stretch a rope over to the next building. And at lunchtime, I'm going to walk across that thing barefoot, and people said, oh, I want to see that. <laughs> so hopefully I will correctly navigate the, uh, the tightrope of, of a political discussion. We have a lot to cover today. And I, I do want to say at the outset that uh, it's, it's obviously difficult to keep your opinions from from creeping into uh, political discussions. I've tried very hard to do that and take a really comprehensive look at all the legislation that's pending right now and what impact would it have for the good or for the bad on the building products industry since that's the, the aspect of, of the economy that we're all engaged in. And so I apologize if some of my personal opinion sneaks in. It's, it's unintentional trying to, to be really objective in, in tackling this topic. So. The first topic that I want to cover is the notion of sort of governing by executive order. And obviously, uh, we've got some executive orders that have been issued. President Trump has issued about three dozen so far in, in the beginning of his presidency. Not really fair to compare that with the total number of executive orders uh, issued by other presidents. But most of the key aspects of the, the question of executive orders compares and contrasts some of the executive orders that we're going to see from President Trump versus what we saw from President Obama. And so President Obama, since all of his orders are now done, we can see that he issued quite a few, but he did not issue as many as George W. Bush, Bill Clinton, or Ronald Reagan. But he did have a way of analyzing topics and, and issues and figuring out you know, how far could an executive order go to accomplish the policy objectives that he was seeking to, to accomplish. Now, in the grand scheme of things, we look at other presidents. President Obama issued you know, less than 10% as many executive orders as the most prolific writers of executive orders that we've ever had in the past. But he had some pretty impactful ones. Well, anything that he put into effect with an executive order, President Trump can now take away with an executive order. If it had gone through Congress, it would probably have to go back through Congress. But one executive order can cancel out another. So now all, anything that he ever accomplished with an executive order is in jeopardy of being changed uh, under the current presidency. That's a key aspect of all of this. Now, obviously, uh, and, and the slides will be made available uh, through the AMA website, so you don't have to feel that you have to take notes uh, on the specific content of the slides. We'll provide that. You know, right now, obviously, in the news, everything is about this Russia probe. So I feel like I have to mention it, but I, I really want to mention it mostly in the context of the fact that I'm, I'm not really going to cover that today, because in and of itself, it's not a piece of legislation that will affect this industry. The only thing that I wanted to mention about it is that obviously, if that becomes more expansive and more people get drawn into it, that can become, in this administration, uh, the, the yoke around folks' neck that would distract from accomplishing some of the things that we're going to lay out today that would be uh, of benefit to the building products industry. So fewer of those things will happen if that probe uh, you know, comes to, to be more expansive. So we have to sort of wait and see what the impact of that is going to be. Now, financial and regulatory policy is always a key aspect of every presidency, and, and it, this is no different. One of the things that uh, is being widely discussed, and there are legis there's legislation out there that's intended to decrease the amount of regulation surrounding the housing industry. So this is a, a, an area where uh, it's probably a pretty clear benefit for the building products industry 
to have fewer regulations surrounding housing because those regulations add to the cost of building homes and anytime you add to the cost of something, other things being equal, the demand for that good will drop. And if that's housing, everybody in this room or most of the people in this room have a, a, some residential aspect to their business, that's going to be reduced demand as a result of that deadweight loss of the regulatory expenses. It's estimated that right now regulatory expense can add $85,000 to the cost of building a single family home. And the impact that that has in certain very tight markets like California is that there really is no such thing as a starter home in those markets because regulatory expenses have pushed it so high that your starter home is your first really nice apartment. And then you maybe you work up to another level of apartment and then eventually as you get further into your career, you buy a home. It's better for a housing market for there to be single family standalone homes that can be afforded by workers in that market. And in a lot, several parts of the country, that's not the case because of regulations. So you, you dial all that in and one of the industry participants that I talked to uh, early on, and I think it was even before uh, inauguration day about President Trump, he said he was really excited. And I said, oh, well, why, why is that out of curiosity? He said, well, you know, the man's a builder. What are the odds that he's gonna do anything that's bad for building? And so that's, sort of a blanket statement, but it, in some of the things that we'll see today, uh, you know, there, there are some regulations that if they come to be, will be positive for the, for the folks in this room. So the Dodd-Frank changes that are being proposed, you could draw a line all the way back to 1934 when the Glass-Steagall Act was put in place to separate banks and insurance companies and investment banks on the notion that the, the, the you know, interaction of those groups as single entities was one of the causes of the Great Depression. So the Great Depression happens, we, we have a, you know, a knee-jerk reaction, glass steel gets passed, all these different companies got broken up, and that was the law of the land for many, many decades. Well then, the 80s and 90s come in, there's a lot of financial deregulation, a lot of those companies became combined again, and then we have the Great Recession, and so now it's seen that some of that deregulation contributed to the, the downturn of the market, and so we have another reaction that says, okay, well, let's put in place this Dodd-Frank Act that, that put a lot of additional regulations on these financial services firms. So now we're going the other direction of deregulation. It's sort of a wave over time of regulation and deregulation. And the, the changes made to the Dodd-Frank uh, 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 laws are being called the Choice Act, which is creating hope and opportunity for investors, consumers, and entrepreneurs. Personally, I'm willing to guess that they had the word choice and then made up the name to, <laughs> to fit that. That's not really a normal way that a bill would be named, but that's what they're calling it, the Choice Act. And it accomplishes a number of different things or would accomplish or will accomplish if it's put into place. But one of them that's interesting, and on one hand, I, I can see where it would be a benefit to the industry, but on the other hand, it's, it's got a potential to be negative for the industry, is the notion that it does away with the previous policy of banks being, quote, too big to fail. And too big to fail means that if Chase Bank or Wells Fargo or Bank of America, any of the majors run into trouble, that inherently the government would have to step in and help them because if they fail, it would cause a series of domino effects around the economy that would be very bad for the economy. So on one hand, it's good to think that you know, major banks won't fail and, and you know, cause those domino effects, but on the other hand, it creates and subsidizes the risk that those institutions might take because they know they're too big to fail, so they can always roll the dice and see what happens and end up you know, uh, being bailed out if things go badly. So it, this is something that will be interesting to see really how that, how that is put into effect, that notion of not supporting banks or being the final, the final support for banks that run into trouble. But in general, uh, it emphasizes oversight by the industry itself, which is always that wave of deregulation, pulls the regulation from the government to the industry, which we certainly see in, in the window and door industry. And it increases some of the uh, penalties for fraud and deception on, on Wall Street. So it'll be interesting to see what ends up happening with that, uh, with that Dodd-Frank, the changes to that. Now moving on to immigration policy, certainly a hot button issue. And again, you know, one that I want to address from the context of how does it impact uh, the window and door and component manufacturing industry. As backdrop, uh, since the executive orders were put into place surrounding immigration, 41,000 people have been arrested. 11,000 of them had no criminal convictions. 30,000 of them had criminal convictions, uh, to put it into perspective. 
there's a lot of tension. Uh, there's a lot of concern of you know having undocumented workers working in a facility. Is is a bus going to pull up and, and arrest people and shut a place down? And it's a lot of negative press, and that's sort of on the minds of of business owners. Interesting is an interesting side point. If you compare the period of from Trump's beginning of his administration to now, with that same period last year, uh, arrests are up 40 percent, but actual deportations have actually dropped which would imply that people are being arrested and then released without being deported, subject to working through their uh, undocumented status. And theoretically, those would be the folks without criminal records. So th there is sort of a mixed approach that's being taken to it, um, but it's created this atmosphere of concern. So we now then you switch into looking at uh, companies and do they want to, how do they want to make sure that their workers are documented and avoid being that next uh, potential problem where you know the immigration service is pulling up and, and arresting workers and in the past uh, it was most common for us to see companies relying on a form I-9 to verify that their workers were uh, documented and what would happen if an undocumented worker signed one of those forms eventually that paperwork would work its way through the government long enough and it would come up and say oh this person's name doesn't match their social security number and you grab that person and say oh uh, I think you wrote your social security number down wrong and they would go home and come up with a new one and then bring it in. And then it went back to the bottom of the pile. That was the way it was handled for years. The new policies have been put into place very much uh, changed that. And now uh, companies are switching more toward E-Verify, which is a much more rigorous search to make sure that uh, a worker is, is legally documented to, to work in the United States. Now, in the M&A in the world, this has become an issue when a company is buying another company, you're taking on their employees, and so if they have undocumented employees and you buy that company and hire those employees, guess what? Now you have undocumented employees. So we've had our first deal where we had a perfect buyer-seller match, everything was perfect, but the buyer insisted on getting E-Verify for all of the employees at the subject company. And so I called the company and said, hey, have you done E-Verify on all of the employees? Uh, well, no, we haven't. Well, what would happen if you did? <laughs> I think the answer was something like there wouldn't be too long a line at the coffee machine tomorrow morning or something to that effect, meaning a lot of the workers were undocumented. And that deal stopped dead in its tracks because that buyer was not willing to be, again, that next company with a problem. And then we're seeing companies, when they buy another company, if there are sort of line level workers that they are not totally sure about, they'll buy a company and then do that E-Verify filter at the moment when the new organization is formed and the assets of the purchase company are being moved over, they'll put that E-Verify there as sort of a gate to make sure that only documented workers pass over into the, to the new co the, of the company. So there's different ways of approaching that. Now in preparing for this presentation, I spoke to a handful of executives in the window and door industry just to get their feedback and, and include some, some uh, comments from industry participants in this presentation. And uh, the immigration policy was one of the diff topics that, uh, that I presented. It was the one on which I got some of the most comments from uh, executives in the industry. Unanimously, they all supported the notion of deporting criminals, obviously. I think that's, that's, there's few people that are advocating uh, in favor of keeping criminals in the country. But they also, by and large, supported uh, making it easier for workers to work legally in the United States because most of them felt that in their manufacturing environments, the overall uh, work ethic and, and work environment benefited from the work ethic of, an, of a migrant workforce, that they're very hard workers and good and valued employees. And so the definite support was to find a way to have those folks continue to be able to work here. Some comments back and forth on the notion of building the wall, it wasn't something I specifically asked about, but some of them commented on it, some in favor, some against. But generally supported uh, in my little small uh, sample group, supported having uh, it easier to, to work in this country. Now, other companies had said, yeah, you know, we're very careful about uh, only hiring documented workers, and that's caused us to have to increase our wages that we pay in order to keep and retain good people. Other companies felt that the immigration status tightening up sort of leveled the playing field because they had all along been careful to only hire documented workers and others had hired undocumented workers and quite frankly the wages for those workers had floated a little below what would be market because there was sort of an understanding that they couldn't do better because they're not documented. And so now you've got an unfair wage differential between two companies that are competing in the same market and the thought was that it leveled the playing field. So I share that only as perspectives of, of others in the industry 
uh, that, that you know, are sort of looking at this issue. Now, healthcare reform is another obviously very strong topic right now. The first attempt by the Republicans to repeal uh, the Affordable Care Act, more commonly called Obamacare, failed in March. And uh, as of right now, they're trying to find some sort of compromise measure to, to, uh, to, to repeal that act and, and change it. The estimate is that based on the, most of the plans that are put out there, about 23 million Americans that currently have coverage would lose that coverage by 2026. What I found in talking to um, owners in, in the window and door industry is that most of them were already offering a plan that was competitive anyway, or maybe they had to tweak a little thing here or change a deductible there. But generally, they were already in compliance or they were too small uh, to need to comply with that plan. Did have a couple people when that was first passed say, yeah, you know, we're right at that cusp of the employee limit, so we've avoided hiring people. But then I'm sure as the market has grown, you know, there's more money to be made by hiring people and growing. So we all sort of adjusted to that and moved on. The point being that I think if that, whether it's right or wrong or should or shouldn't, if that is repealed or not, I don't think we'll have a big impact on the building products industry and the window and door industry in particular. Some of the other executives did point out that when it was first passed, uh, it caused them to have to offer a little bit higher benefits. So at the time, it came at a time when they, they couldn't very well afford that. But now that everybody's sort of dialed that in, and quite frankly, the market's doing better, it's viewed by a lot of executives as just a distraction. You know, maybe, maybe we should focus on other things that are more important because this is already out there. The sun didn't fall out of the sky when that was passed, and everybody's kind of adjusting to it. Interestingly, when I asked uh, the group of executives that I contacted who were companies ranging in size from, from the smallest to the biggest companies in the industry, uh, a good number of them got back to me and said, you know, honestly, I'd love to help you with comments on that, but I, there's not really any legislation that I'm watching right now or concerned about because the market's doing so well. I just don't see anything out there that could have that negative an effect on my business, and I'm just sort of making money while it's out there to be made, and I don't see anything that's really in the way of the industry. So in a way, uh, sort of a non-comment is also an interesting comment that, that that's how uh, people are viewing the, the market right now. <coughs> Now, taking a look at environmental policy, one of, the, one of the executive orders that was signed early on was a reversal of some of the, um, the requirements of this Waters of the United States rule. And it was a rule that was originally put into place to, to um, manage the, the quality of navigable waters, meaning a water that a boat can get up and down and for shipping and so forth, because boats come and go and they can tend to pollute. And so they wanted to control that. Well, then that over time, that understanding of what bodies of water that applied to was expanded more and more and more and it got to the point where almost anything that was any near anywhere near anything bigger than a mud puddle could be regulated under that rule and it added to the time that it took for example to develop residential uh, subdevelopments which is f pretty far from what it was originally intended to do so uh, President Trump signed an executive order to, to whittle that back uh, you know <laughs> he did make a statement that that rule was costing hundreds of thousands of jobs they really couldn't necessarily find any of those or sort of demonstrate where those might be, but nonetheless, it was it was applauded by builders uh, because it was going to make it easier to build in the residential side of the market, and so you know which would be a net positive for the building products industry. Now, the most controversial uh, environmental change that's happened under the Trump administration is certainly the withdrawal from the Paris Accords. There's 194 countries still in the agreement. If we withdraw, only the United States, Syria, and Nicaragua will not be members of this agreement. So we're not in uh, much company. We don't have too many other countries that have viewed this this way. Uh, it, it's, it's the same kind of thing where it was put into place with an executive order, so it can be undone with an executive order, which has been signed. Uh, interestingly, under the actual terms of the agreement, we really can't <coughs> withdraw from the agreement until 2020. All that can happen is plans can be put in place to withdraw us from the agreement, but we'll still be in that agreement until 2020 anyway. So it's not an overnight change that happens. The other interesting aspect of the withdrawal from the Paris Accords is that uh, since it was announced, heads of cities and states and big companies have come out and said, hey, we think that was a mistake. We don't think the United States should have left that agreement. And so therefore, we as a state or we as a company or we as a city are going to do our part to continue to abide by the requirements of those Paris Accords. Now, if that catches on and if it actually happens, and especially if it becomes widespread so that there's not a 
play to be made of one state complying and another not complying and you become the path of least resistance and so people want to build their factory there. If it gets to be a pretty widespread movement, it'll be kind of a fascinating example of a grassroots sort of self-initiated um, movement out there to um, essentially override the effectiveness of a presidential order. So it would be, it'll be interesting to watch that and see if we do truly withdraw from that and if some of these states and municipalities actually stick with their current indication that they want to continue to to abide by those accords. So it would be very interesting. Um, under the current budget, there's a clause under the budget cuts for the EPA that says that uh, President Trump wants to see the EPA transfer the ownership and implementation of Energy Star to a non-governmental entity. Now, that's you know sort of classic privatization, which you could make a strong case for that. What I think would be a loss for the people in the building products industry would be if any less use is made of the Energy Star program or uh, you know image or logo and so forth, which has you know a high 85 percent brand recognition among consumers, which is a very hard to to win that level of of recognition in in this in this economy with so many different you know social media and different aspects of, of advertising coming at, a, a, at the public to get up to that 85 percent level is a hard a hard fight and so it would be a shame to see that go away now we in this room are proof positive that an industry can self-regulate and set standards for itself and do so in a responsible manner that encourages an upward climb of you know of progress and better products and better performance and so forth no, no finer example of that than, than AMA. But on the flip side, this program right now is under the EPA, so you know it's, it's not maybe being administered the same way that we do things in this organization. So the interesting thing will be to see uh, what hands the Energy Star logo ends up in, and we can only hope that it ends up in such a way that folks can continue to use that as a differentiator that they've come up with a product that's more environmentally friendly and saves energy and is, is, is good for the environment. Codes are still a major driving force. It's important to remember that whatever legislation is up there, these code setting bodies, obviously I don't need to tell anybody in this room, are a major impact on what happens in the building products industry and, and sort of the difference between the haves and the have nots that can be created when certain codes are put into place. Other times we've worked with companies that have said, oh, you know, there's a code in our area that requires, you know, some aspect, some product aspect, and we have it, none of our competitors do. And I think, oh, that sounds to me like a great sustainable advantage. And, you know, ah, no, they say, well, the, the codes aren't enforced. You know, the code's on the books, but it's not enforced. Well, you know, you, if it's on the books, nobody wants to make a product that doesn't comply with the code because the next thing you know, they'll start enforcing it and now you sold a product that didn't comply with the codes. But the point is that the codes and their existence and their enforcement or non-enforcement is a major aspect of what happens in the building products industry. And so just obviously encourage everybody anytime there's a public comment period on any of those codes and be active participants in that because that's the best way. And how many of us have seen these changes over time? Even the 30-30 rule that in the, in the downturn helped spur some sales for some residential window manufacturers probably saved a handful of companies uh, that rule was put into place and not with enough industry comment and ended up setting up a system where a window has to perform the same way in Minneapolis as it does in Miami. And we all know in this room that that's not right. The public probably doesn't know that. But there should have been more comment from industry participants. And so we would encourage you to, to make your voice heard in those code setting processes. Now in terms of tax policy, every president tinkers with the tax policy try to send a message of what kind of growth they're trying to encourage or, or uh, reward or punish certain ways of earning and making income. Under the proposed uh, tax changes, it would simplify the tax bracket plan, just three levels, 10%, 25%, 35%. Nothing objectively important about that to the building products industry. What I think is important is the notion of, passing, of changing the pass-through rate to 15% because a lot of building products companies are set up as LLCs or S-Corps. They're passed through entities. They don't pay taxes themselves, and the taxable income is passed through to their the business owners. And if you think of dropping that tax rate to 15%, where certainly right now owners of LLCs are paying a much higher personal rate than 15%, think of the difference between cutting it to 15% versus raising it to 95%. You know, if you raise that tax bracket to 
business owners would say, why would I invest in my business if I make some great product and it's an overnight success? I only get to keep a nickel out of every dollar anyway, so why bother? You look the other direction, a tax cut that effectively cuts that income tax rate, they get to keep more of every dollar of earnings from their pass-through business so they have more of an incentive that they're going to, are they going to invest in the stock market or are they going to invest in their company? They're going to invest in their company because the more they earn, they get to keep more of that dollar. So, you know, I won't comment on whether that's going to balance the budget, unbalance the budget, the other pluses and minuses of that. But objectively, in and of itself, if that pass-through rate change goes through, that's a net positive for the building products industry. Uh, just to compare as a point of interest in, a, in an order of magnitude, the size of the Trump tax cut, it's smaller than Reagan and Truman's cuts, bigger than the cuts that Obama and others have proposed, both both Bush's and, and Obama and his, his other term. It's a sort of an upper part of the pack in terms of the size of the tax cut that's being proposed, just to put that in perspective. One of the other tax changes that's being discussed is this border adjustment tax. Now, a border adjustment tax is a destination tax saying, hey, where is this good headed? And if it comes from one country to another, it essentially adds a tax on the part of the, the product that came from the other country. So you, you buy a component in China, you bring it to the US and fabricate it into some other complete product, then you're going to have uh, a tax on the part that came from China. Now, I'll talk in a minute about some comments I got from some Canadian window and door manufacturers. It won't surprise you to learn they're not excited about this potential tax because as much as we're friendly neighbors and think of ourselves as neighbors, they are a different country and their goods would be taxed just as much as if they came from China. And, uh, you know, we'll talk about that more in a, in a little bit. But some of the aspects of this border tax would, would encourage companies that have these hordes of cash, you know, hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars, if not low trillions of dollars overseas that they don't repatriate and bring home because of ta tax differentials. It's better for them from a tax standpoint to keep those dollars overseas we would benefit mightily in this country from the investment of some of those dollars into uh, the, you know, projects and things that could happen here in the United States. And you know, if you think about it, a corporation, especially a public corporation, its, its obligation is to maximize shareholder value. That's the, the first and, and most important marching order for a public corporation, maximize shareholder value. And if it cannot be shown that bringing money back into the United States maximizes value, or conversely, if it can be shown that it d decreases value because of the tax hit, they will not do it. So they will not bring that money home until it can be shown that they can make more by bringing it home than they're making letting it sit overseas. It will not happen, and it cannot happen. So I don't know if this is the way to fix that, but something should fix that, and it would benefit uh, everybody in this industry. Some of the other changes that are, are being proposed uh, would be to allow fully expensing uh, investments in tangible property. I can tell you that we've worked with companies over time that took advantage of all of those accelerated depreciation offers that came up. Companies that were fortunate to have some, some cash on the balance sheet and when those offers came up, they went out and bought that new delivery truck. They went out and bought that new piece of machinery, new piece of equipment. And walking through those places now, it's amazing the efficiency that they've been able to drive in their, in their uh, manufacturing processes and the tax credit had the exact effect that it was intended to have. It was intended to make people invest in their business to make businesses more efficient and more productive. And I've seen it firsthand where they will have bought some piece of machinery that maybe the day they bought it, the market was still a little bit soft. It was probably a purchase ahead of when they needed it, but now they're humming along and some of those pieces of machinery can take an aluminum profile that used to go into a station, get a couple things drilled, go to the next station, get a little bracket cut, hole cut in it, go to the next thing, get a spot for a hinge put there. All these different things would happen. Well, now they have these multi-axis machines. That profile goes into one spot and like 11 things happen to that profile all at one time. And the decrease in man minutes can be from 20 or 30 man minutes on a profile down to five or 10 man minutes. And so that impact, you just can't imagine the benefit to the productivity and to the profitability that that has. And quite frankly, it helps alleviate some of the labor crunch and problems that they're having because you, you don't, can't find workers, some of the skilled workers, semi-skilled workers. Having those kinds of efficiency gains alleviates some of that, uh, some of that labor crunch. So those, those programs, that aspect of the program, again, a, a, positive, a positive for the industry. Some of the fiscal policy, there's a total government budget proposed, 4.1 trillion, uh, decrease in some of the discretionary spending government programs of one and a half trillion dollars over 10 years and supposedly would balance the budget. 
by 2027. Obviously, no one, no single president can do anything and know uh, with any certainty that the budget will actually be balanced at that point in the future because there will be other presidents in the intervening period that will do other things and it'll balance or it won't. HUD, EPA, and OSHA all had their uh, budgets cut. If, if, if you've ever been pestered by an OSHA inspector, you know, however many times per year, uh, a funding cut for that probably means that they're going to come around less often. Obviously, that's something the industry is going to have to self-police to keep safety standards high, or else in a future presidency it'll go back the other way, and you know they'll be they'll be uh, increasing the inspections again. One interesting point that came out of that is that part of the cut that was made to the EPA budget was the EPA's federal administration and oversight of the lead paint rule that is near and dear to everybody in this room. Now, even with federal oversight, I've attended meetings at, at, at AMA and other window and door events where they talked about that rule and you couldn't get a straight answer as to how things on that rule worked from the speaker to two people that had implemented the same thing through the same you know, uh, consulting company. To there, There's just an absolute disparity of information. I've got to think that pushing that down to the state level is only going to make that worse. But on the other hand, maybe that means the, the regulation of that will be less rigid, which that was another policy that was put in place without enough industry comment. Uh, the point being, changes are, are on the way for that lead paint roll if this budget is, is passed. And so it will be important for us as an industry to digest those changes and understand over the next you know, year what really is now the enforcement level on those lead paint rolls and, and what, if anything, needs to be done differently to, to account for that. Now, infrastructure spending, uh, President Trump has pointed out that he, he wants to spend about a trillion dollars on, on infrastructure, which is an incredible amount of money. And it, it, it's amazing to think that it falls so far short of the 3.3 trillion that we think is needed to upgrade bridges and, and railroads and things. And I know, you know, you drive down the highway and you go over these railroad overpasses or you go under them. And sometimes you just think, well, I just hope that thing <laughs> stays up there until I get under it because some of them are pretty much falling apart. So obviously infrastructure spending is, is good for the economy. It creates jobs for the, the actual building of the infrastructure. Improved infrastructure in a given area tends to encourage residential development in that area. So any of the areas of the country that are lucky enough to benefit from any of that infrastructure spending, it's very probably uh, going to have some positive economic benefits. Now for the window and door industry, where that infrastructure spending would have a negative is that those projects do require a lot of bodies to be hired to go work on them. And just as in the oil fields and places like that, when that became the hot area, they just bid up wages until they had people that were willing to move to these you know, areas out in the middle of nowhere and work on those oil projects. The same thing will happen on these infrastructure projects. The wages will get bid up until all those positions are filled. That's only going to exacerbate the difficulty of hiring workers in a factory environment. And so over the, you know, the next few years, if that, any portion of that infrastructure spending happens and the immigration changes are made that cuts some of the worker supply, you're going to see much more emphasis on modular building, on you know, site building or factory building and in installing unitized on site. You know, anything that's modular or unitized or pre-hung will have a premium over the next 10 years versus things that require uh, site labor. It'll be a definite shift toward factory labor. Taking a look at some of the, the China policies, and, and China is, you know, is a definitely a, a thorny issue because they're an important trade partner. We import a lot of things from them. A lot of you know, industries benefit from cheaper components that can be brought over from China. Uh, you know, on the negative side, those ships tend to go back to China pretty empty, you know, high on the water, they call them, meaning they don't have a lot of American goods weighing them down going back in the other direction. Some currency issues. So China is always kind of a point of contention, and it's a question about how is every new president going to handle, uh, you know, China. Now, Trump had some early tension with the China relationship. He took a call from the president of Taiwan, which, you know, hasn't been done in so many years. And the, the, the head of China was, was upset about that uh, because they think of tai Taiwan as part of China. Uh, he's obviously pushing them all the time now to rein in North Korea. That's always a wild card. You know, you see those updates on the news of missile tests and all kinds of craziness. And, you know, it, it's, it's, that's a whole tightrope uh, to be walked. The, the notion of currency not free floating, you know, their currency being uh, artificially kept down makes their goods even cheaper and makes it even more likely that we'll import 
from them, that's an as aspect of it that's a challenge. Now, we've, if we end up pulling out of the Paris Accord, there are those that say, well, that just leaves China and Asia as a, you know, gives them a chance to step forward and assert their leadership even more in Asia by being a strong participant in that Paris Accord, where we've now stepped back from it. So that's a potential, you know, problem. One kind of funny side note, when, when uh, Shinzo Abe came from Japan and visited with Donald Trump, he took him down to Mar-a-Lago and was smart enough to have Ernie Els come and play in a, in a, I don't know if it was a foursome, if it was just the three of them playing golf that afternoon. And, and uh, what, from what they said, Shinzo Abe just loved that, that that was a great day and, you know, golf diplomacy is what, you know, Trump referred to that as. Well, then the president of China comes over and he has, has personally ordered the closure of about 200 golf courses in China because he views it as a evil capitalistic <laughs> solo game. And, uh, and, and so when uh, he came to Mar-a-Lago to meet with President Trump, it was sort of like, uh, oh, just ignore that, that green area out there. That's just a big old lawn, you know. Not a mention, not a word was mentioned of golf, I'm told. So uh, kind of a funny difference there. But... Uh, you know, essentially, some of the practices and, the, and the, the border tax and things like that are essentially aimed at making Chinese goods more expensive uh, to encourage people to use more U.S. products is, is what it basically uh, boils down to. One of the areas that's important in this uh, room certainly is aluminum profiles. A lot been discussion. There's been a lot of discussion of putting tariffs, more tariffs on uh, aluminum brought over from China so that if you're a person that's sourcing profiles from China, they'd get more expensive. If you're a person that's sourcing purely domestically extruded profiles, there could be a cost differential created there that will be very important to take into account. Uh, to, so I'd encourage you to keep an eye on that, if, particularly if you're on the wrong side of it, not wrong, but on the other side of it of bringing profiles over from China, it would have the potential to move that price against you. Uh, another company, interestingly, we talked to buy some manufacturing equipment from China and brings that over. And they've reported that it's getting harder to get visa, temporary visa approval for the techs from the equipment company to come over and install and set up the machinery and teach the workers how to use it and kind of make sure everything is, is dialed in and then they go back over to China. Those visas are taking longer to get. Now that's kind of a fascinating way to add some soft costs to buying equipment from overseas. So if you want to encourage somebody to buy equipment not from China, one way is to slap a tariff on it. That tends to, to be hard to get approved. Another little soft way is to just slow down those visa approvals because now if I can't get somebody to come and work on that machine in a timely manner, maybe I'll consider working with someone else on my machinery and equipment. So it's kind of an interesting uh, sort of you know, side door way of, of uh, influencing that. Some of the other comments, just you know, a, a potpourri of comments that we got from, from, other, uh, from the window and door industry participants that we talked to about this presentation. They said, you know, it's hard to get that next generation of factory workers to come in. Among the young people, they've got health insurance through their parents for a lot of years after, after high school and college, so they're not motivated by that. They'll take a few bucks an hour less to work in a Starbucks or in a, some retail environment where it's more comfortable than working in a factory. It can be a, a difficult environment. It's tough to get that next generation of, of workers in there. Uh, another industry executive said, hey, you know, health care costs are going up. And of all the debate back and forth on health care, I don't see either side putting forth a plan that's going to solve the problem or, you know, really move the needle for us as business owners who are paying a, a fortune in, in uh, health insurance expenses. So that's a, an aspect of it. Obviously, with the immigration patterns into the United States, there's more, uh, more migrant workers in the south and southwest, that sort of sunbelt across the country. So obviously, the immigration uh, changes that are being discussed and made are felt more sharply by companies in those regions than they would be in the very northern strip of the country just by uh, the result of the geography relative to Mexico. Uh, so others you know, applauded any of this corporate tax reform that could get some of that money uh, repatriated back to the United States. And while uh, popular opinion is certainly that it was bad to withdraw from the Paris Accords, some of them said, hey, I think that withdrawing from the Paris Accords is great because now we can renegotiate it and get ourselves on a level footing with China and India and not be disadvantaged relative to two, you know, sort of up and coming economies that represent strong, um, strong potential sources of uh, competition. So then, you know, I did get some comments from some Canadian window and door manufacturers. Not surprisingly, as I said, they were not excited about a border tax or anything that would uh, increase the cost of their goods. A lot of those country companies are located in uh, sort of eastern Canada and sell down into the northeast United States. So they benefit from the proximity of um, 
not only a big chemical production area that makes, there, there's a lot of vinyl profiles available up there, but they're close to wood, sources of wood to be made into wood windows. And so then you fabricate that and sell it down into the Northeast. There's a you know, pretty brisk business there. Some of the uh, Canadian manufacturers we talked to pointed out, you know, gee, we're already, we already have a pretty balanced trade level with the United States where they buy just about as much from us as, as they ship to us. You know, kind of why pick on us sort of thing, you know, when, when they're already a good balanced trading partner. Uh, and, you know, they were hopeful that the, any border tax that would be passed would, would not be, you know, geared toward them because they sort of saw NAFTA as being more geared toward not, not losing jobs to Mexico rather than worrying about Canada since the trade was already pretty balanced. And one of the companies pointed out that in, in 09 when uh, the Recovery Act was passed, there were some Buy American clauses in it. And uh, that led to some of the Canadian provinces passing kind of retaliatory tariffs. So once we all go down that path, you know, now all of a sudden only the government wins because they're collecting tariffs and the production and manufacturing drop below what would be normal and, and optimal. Um, some of the other legislation, I'll walk through these kind of quickly because I want to leave time for q and I thought this was just kind of interesting. I think the construction limit on, on wood frame buildings is five stories and you can put a cement podium down so you sneak a seven story building out of wood. They've got these engineered wood components now that have been tested and demonstrated in Europe and other places where they're building much higher buildings. This picture here is of a 14 story wood frame apartment building. Just You just don't normally see that. Uh, but it turns out that over the last five years, 17 of these buildings over seven stories have been built around different parts of the world. And there's one that just was approved on June 6th called the Framework Project that's in Oregon that's a 12 story uh, wood frame building that's being built out there. It's approved, tested, and so forth. And so that'll be the tallest wood building in the United States. So obviously the lumber producers are pretty happy about this. It comes at, at a time when uh, you know, there, there are different lumber agreements that are being worked out with Canada. That would, you know, the more you use uh, wood for structural building, the, the better you better have a grip on your supply of that lumber. So, uh, you know, those two things will be interesting to see how they interact with each other. But basically, the Timber Innovation Act has been put forward to make it easier to build tall buildings out of wood. That's something that's being uh, proposed. There's some other, you know, legislation that you'll hear discussed. The notion of repealing the mortgage interest deduction. I think that's largely a negative for the building products industry. If that happens, we, we, we as an industry should hope that it doesn't, uh, in my opinion, because again, that uh, increases the cost of housing because it takes away a tax deduction that you get for owning housing. And anything that increases the cost of housing will reduce demand for housing and reduce uh, sales of residential products. Uh, they're trying to fix the Social Security underfunding crisis without just slapping a big payroll tax on it because obviously, again, increase the cost of a good, in this case, employing people. You'll decrease the demand for that good, meaning the more payroll tax I have to pay, I'll hire fewer people. So that's not good. Um, trying to increase the conforming loan limits for the, the various government-backed mortgage associations so that you can have a, a larger loan still comply and, and be an easier loan to get extended because, quite frankly, home prices have gone up and, and people want that, you know, that assurance. Uh, and then the other programs looking to maintain green housing and affordable housing. Uh, some of those subsidies are sort of on the chopping block, so to speak. Uh, other programs included, you know, forestry requirements that, that require a stricter chain of custody tracking so that you're not just buying from a middleman who just, you know, wiped out the last stand of mahogany in whatever part of the world and, and now he tells you, no, 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 there's a big old pile of this stuff back there. Don't, don't worry about it at all. Just get, buy this lumber for me and, and keep moving. You know, it keeps, keeps it in a more sustainable source. Um, and then there's some changes that are being made to the National Flood Insurance Program because there have been a lot of floods and Katrina and so forth that would increase the uh, premiums for that National Flood Insurance Program. And they're putting, trying to put measures in place to sort of slow down that increase just to give the industry more time to adjust to it. Uh, obviously, that's a kind of a back and forth with the government. If you slow the premium increase, then that's less money for the government and effectively more money they would lose if there's a big flood. But if you make the flood insurance too expensive and no one buys it, then that's, again, you know, less demand for housing or it's, it's housing that gets destroyed and can't be replaced because that insurance was structurally too expensive to, to afford. So there's a definite give and take. There's no free lunch in life anywhere, but that's definitely a situation where there's no free lunch because somebody has to bear the cost of those homes being re rebuilt when they're destroyed. Um, I wanted to list here, just for your, your reference, some of the legislative agenda that AMA is working for uh, to try to accomplish in Washington and, and put in place. Some of them I've already talked about, the Choice Act, 
you know, the others are, are um, of the type that you would expect, you know, encouraging innovation, encouraging energy savings. And so part of your participation in AMA goes to support uh, AMA's good work in Washington to ensure that legislation is passed that continues to benefit the window and door manufacturing industry and is, is informed by input from all of you. So that's, that's uh, to, certainly to the credit of the organization. The last thing I wanted to mention is that, you know, the best, the best way to deal with any of this is to make your voice heard by participating in, in uh, the, the dialogue and supporting organizations. Whatever opinion you have about any of this, um, and, and no one's thrown any eggs yet, so I must not have offended anybody too much, hopefully. Uh, you know, whatever your opinion is, I guarantee you there's an organization out there working to make that opinion reality in, in Washington. So support that organization with your money, with your time. Uh, there's groups that I'm, I'm part of that do fly-ins to Washington and meet with congressmen and senators, and it was kind of neat to see some of the pictures from those fly-ins. There's these sort of tween teenage kids in these pictures, and I asked, you know, well, he said, oh, you know, I bring my kids with me because I want them to understand that this is what government is, is people interacting with Washington and saying their opinion and then policy being made, and hopefully you had a, a hand in, in impacting it. And so there's sort of that next generation of, of active participants in the process coming up, and I just would encourage all of you uh, to do the same. That's the only way to, you know, as, as we used to say, if you, if, you don't, if you don't participate in it, you don't get to complain about it if it doesn't go your way. <laughs> so better to, better to participate. So with that, I, I think I'm down to my last, yeah. Well, listen, I always appreciate being here. I always appreciate being part of an AMA meeting, and I'll be available afterward if there are any other questions. Thank you very much for having me today. I like Mike Collins. I think what he brings to AMA is pretty pertinent to our industry and um, usually salient points, you know, for especially what's going on now. So, yeah. I thought it was very informative. I thought he touched on a lot of things that affect the building industry, and I thought I was very impressed. I thought it was very good. I thought the information on what's going on in the industry, what the impact is going to be on the government and Trump was very well presented and I think was very equally um, cited. I thought Michael did a good job of keeping politics out of a speech about politics. Uh, yes, I did, but I uh, um, subscribe to Trump's Twitter feed, so I get more Trump information than I really need. <laughs> Mike, as always, when he does these things, is really concise. Um, I think he highlighted all the uh, possible areas of, of impact in the building trades. Um, I don't know if it could have been done any better in that amount of time. I, I think you did a superb job. I thought that it was incredibly factual, on point, and somehow unbiased.